was to ask you to tell me what really makes you happy, what would your answer be? Dogs. Songs? Dogs. Oh, dogs. <laughs> Boy, where did I get songs out of dogs? <laughs> Say it's that I'm getting too old. <laughs> I won't tell you that. I'll tell my dad that. Okay. <laughs> but if he's getting too old, that means I'm getting a lot older than him. <laughs> but we all want to be happy, don't we? Does it surprise you to know that God wants you to be happy too? Because he does. But you might be surprised to find out. What Jesus said about happiness is quite different from what you and I might expect. Most of us think that to be happy means to have something like lots of money, having plenty to eat, having someone to take care of us, or being well liked by everyone. But that isn't what Jesus said. One day Jesus went up onto the side of a mountain he sat down, gathered his disciples around him, and began to teach them about happiness. Even though these are not his exact words, I'm kind of paraphrasing on what Jesus said, used, used. I think they will be happy us to understand what he taught. He said things like, be happy when you are poor in spirit. Because then you will find that your riches are in the kingdom of heaven. Be happy when you feel you have lost or what's <coughs> most dear to you. Because it is then that you will feel the love of the one who is the most dear to you. Be happy with what you have. Because then you will find that your heavenly father provides everything that you need. Be happy when you are hungry for the things of God because then you will find that only He can satisfy. Be happy when you are caring for others because if it is in caring for others that you will find that you have a heavenly Father who cares for you. Be happy when your heart is right with God because it is then that you will see that God is at work in the world around you. Be happy when you help others to get along peacefully with one another because it is then that you will know the peace that comes from being a part of the family of God. Be happy when others treat you badly because you follow me because your reward will be great in heaven. You see, happiness is not feel, a feeling that is brought about by the things that happens to us. It is an attitude that we'll have because of what we have in our hearts. Would you like to pray? Dear Father, help us to have the happiness that you want for us. Happiness that comes not from what happens to us, Look for what happens inside us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, the story is told of a man who was on his way to a costume ball on a Sunday evening. He rented a fairly realistical Satan's costume. It was a red suit with a tail and a skin-tight mask with horns. It was quite a quality outfit. And he kind of looked like Satan. In order to get to the party, he had to walk a fairly long distance and was caught in a sudden rainstorm. So he sought shelter in a church building where the services were just ended. Just as he ran into the building, there was a loud clap of thunder and the crowd turned to look. A flash of lightning lit up the door frame. It was so sudden and so shocking that the people thought this was really Satan. And they panicked and rushed for the exit.
exits. But the intruder didn't realize what it was that was frightening them and thought that maybe the church had been struck by lightning and it was on fire. So he raced after them. Everybody got out except for one elderly lady. Turning in fear, she stretched out her hands. Oh, devil, please don't hurt me. I know I've been a member of this church for 30 years, but I've really been on your side all the time. <laughs> <laughs> now, what that lady was saying was she was saying, I surrender. I give up. You win. She was afraid that he would hurt her. So she abandoned her faith and yielded to the enemy. Now, that's just a humorous story. It never really did happen. But too often there are Christians who literally surrender to Satan. They give up and refuse to stand firm in their faith. That is why the Bible repeatedly tells us to stand firm. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the word of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Ephesians 6.13 Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the, day, the evil day. And having done all, stand firm. And of course, our text today says, So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast to the teaching we pass on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. The Bible is fairly clear on this. God calls us to stand firm. What's interesting is that God repeatedly tells us stories of men and women who stood firm. Moses stood before the Pharaoh and ultimately led the people of God out of slavery. The people of Israel stood before the walls of Jericho and the walls fell down. And Esther stood before the throne of Cyrus and saved the Jews from destruction. Now, what is interesting about all these stories is that that's about all these folks did. They stood. Their victories did not come from the forces of arms, swords, or spears. Their triumph wasn't accomplished because of their personal powers. They didn't win the day because they were influential people. They overcame evil because they trusted in God and they stood firm. Edmund Brooks said, the only thing necessary to triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. But when godly people stand firm in the face of evil, evil is frustrated and evil is defeated. And so God tells us to stand. Stand firm. You may be the only person who is able to stand up for God in the face of a bad situation. So stand firm. And oftentimes, people who stand for God have to stand alone. Many of the great heroes and heroines of Scripture face dangers all by themselves. But it was their courage in those times of danger that turned the tides. I read a story that, about World War II. The Germans nearly won the Battle of the Bulge. All they needed was just enough time to reach the objective. But they never
ever got to their destination quickly enough. The Germans didn't lose battle, lose battle of the bulge because they faced a huge Allied army. No, they lost because they kept running into small groups of soldiers who refused to yield. Small companies of men who stood firm because they knew that they were the only ones who could stand against the might of the German war machine. They stood firm and they stood alone. And they turned the tide of the battle. That is what God calls you and I to be willing to do. God calls us to stand firm. Even if you have to stand alone. Because everything may depend on you. In the book of Esther, an evil man named Haman, who hated the Jews so much that he had taught the king into passing a law calling for them to be destroyed. Esther was approached by her uncle, Mordecai, to appeal to the king to save the people. But she was afraid. And Mordecai rebuked her with these words. If you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Esther listened to her uncle. And she stood firm before the king and saved her people from destruction. But now, why would a Christian not stand firm? Why would they back down in the face of opposition? One reason is that a lot of folks are afraid of standing alone. In fact, there are actually a name for that kind of fear. Ban bandwagon effect. In sports, the bandwagon effect describes fair weather fans. Those folks who only get on the bandwagon to support the team when they're winning. But amongst psychologists, the bandwagon effect is the tendency of for people and social and sometimes political situations to align themselves with the majority opinion and do or believe things because many other people appear to be doing or believing the same. Another reason a lot of people don't stand firm in the face of evil is they don't want to get hurt. They're afraid of suffering for what they might say. They might lose a job or a friend, or they might lose something else that's valuable to them. There's a poem that I once read by J.H. Newman that says, Time was, I shrank from what was right, from fear of what was wrong. I would not brave the sacred fight because the foe was strong. Abraham Lincoln said, be sure you put your feet in the right place, then stand firm. Now back when I was a kid, I, my dad bought me a trampoline and we had made a little game and the game was called King of the Trampoline. So you pretty much can get where this is going. One person would stand in the middle while other kids would stand on the end, and they would jump in and try to knock the one in the middle out of the little circle without falling off the trampoline or down themselves. I was good at the game. I could plant my feet just right and when they jumped in, I was able to 
knock them off and they fell down. And that means I put my feet in the right place and I stood firm. But as a Christian, how do I do that? How do I make sure my feet are in the right place so that I can stand firm for God? Well, our text today says we do that by holding to the teachings that we were taught in Scripture. You see, the Bible is the foundation of our faith. It is in the Bible that we discover what is right and what is wrong. God is not interested in my opinion or yours. He's not influenced by churches who ignore sin. He's not interested in editorials of newspapers. You either line up with Scripture or you're wrong. Whatever the Bible says, that's where we put our feet. Peter and John were once commanded not to preach in the name of Jesus. And do you know what they said? Judge for yourself whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. They refused to back down. They made sure their feet were planted in the right place. And they stood firm. But notice Peter and John were respectful. They didn't insult the Sanhedrins. They didn't mobilize a protest. They just said, this is where we stand. And we're not backing down. This brings us to the final way Christians should stand firm. Earlier in the sermon, I quoted 1 Corinthians 16, 13, that said, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, like man, be strong. But I didn't include the next verse, which says, let all that you do be done in love. Now, when I was younger, there didn't seem to be any action shows in the movies or on TV that show Christians beating up on criminals. I mean, there were folks from Eastern religions handing out evil folks their lunch, but not Christians. In the movies, there was Steven Seagal, who played a Buddhist who would literally destroy gangs of bad guys by himself. On TV, David Carradine played a Shaolin monk who defended the innocent with some very cool kung fu moves. But I don't remember one single Christian doing stuff like that. I mean, if we're Christians, and we're all we're all about righteousness, you think we'll get a TV hero who punches someone in the nose once in a while. But that just didn't seem to happen. And there's a reason for that. Christianity was built, wasn't built on violence. There was no school of martial arts ever created by the early Christians. Because Jesus didn't teach us to behave that way. Now, I'm not trying to say Christians shouldn't defend their family, their country, or themselves. But by our very nature, we should not be violent, cruel, or nasty folks. Jesus said, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And here in 1 first, first Corinthians, Paul reminds the Christians to stand firm, but do it in love. 
Be respectful. Set your feet and do not move. But don't even get into an argument. 2 Timothy 2, verses 24 through 26. The Lord's servant must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Those who oppose him, he must gently instruct in the hope that God will grant them represented leading them to acknowledge of the truth and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. The fact of the matter is God has called us to stand. To not back off our faith for anyone or anything. To do this gently, but without apologizing for what we believe in. The world will fight you, and evil will oppose you, but when the dust clears, you'll know it's worth the cost. I want to close with this observation by a writer from America's Revolutionary Time, Thomas Paine. The harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. What we obtain too cheap, we esteem too lightly. It is dearness only that gives everything its value. I love the man that can smile in trouble, that can gather strength from distress and grow brave by reflection. Tis the business of little minds to shrink, but he whose heart is firm and whose conscience approves his conduct will persuade his principles unto death. So the question you need to think about this morning is this. Do you stand firm with Jesus? May you grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.